There's a God in heaven that's going to hold me accountable for everything that I've said. That's enough to scare you. You don't scare me. He does. So uh, anyway, take your Bible and turn to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus and chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. The Lord had met with uh, the people there at the foot of the mountain, and Moses was given the Ten Commandments. And... Um, the 11th commandment, I bet most people don't know the 11th commandment, is keep the other 10. But Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Did you catch two phrases in all of these verses? One that says, that love me, and one that says, that hate me. The first commandment is, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And most people don't. Aren't you glad we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven? Because if you did, we wouldn't make it. God says salvation is a gift, that it's free. But there's something else that I wanted to mention to you in these words, and that is, a question that I wanted to put to you. Do, do you worship idols? Do you worship idols? I want you to notice what God says here. And he makes a statement in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now we know there is no other God except the true and living God. All the other ones are fake gods. There's only one true God. But there's many gods made by people. And they make up their own gods. The Bible even calls Satan the God, the prince of the air. So there's other gods. And you might even have a few gods you've made up. Everybody seems to have another god. But I, uh, I wrote a few things down that I think are important. I want you to look in verse 3 where he makes a statement. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. An idol represents another god. An idol represents another god. Something that you worship other than the true god. You say, well, I, that, that, that's not me. I ain't through yet. Did you know you can make sports a god? Did you know you can make money a god? Did you know you can make your wife or your husband or your children a God and put them before the Lord? In other words, God says he is a jealous God. He doesn't want anybody making anything God but him. And he won't tolerate any other gods, man-made gods. And many people have idols, things that they worship in the place of God. Government can become a God to you. The White House can become God to you. The devil can become your God. You'd be surprised how many other gods there are. And there's a lot of religions that have a lot of idols and worship false gods. I know that there's nobody like that here. Look at verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. It's make, talking about making images of things that becomes your God, or is an image of your God that you bow down to and you worship. I don't believe it's talking about having your picture taken. Some of you probably shouldn't take your picture. Have you ever had somebody say, let me take your picture, and they say, you know, it, it'll break the camera. It'll break the camera. I had that happen. And it literally broke their camera. They took my, it broke their camera. That broke my heart. I knew I had a face that would stop a clock, but not break the camera. But look in verse 5. In verse 5, idols means that you don't worship God. And if you don't worship God, then God says you hate him. You hate him. See what he says there? In the last part, he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So it's not wise for you and I to put anything between us and God. It becomes an idol. It's a substitute for the true God. God is a jealous God. God told his people that when you go into the land, you're not to carry out of Egypt the idols of Egypt. You're not to worship the gods of the people in the land where I'm sending you. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them, and you ought to underline these three words, that love me, that love me. See, God wants you to love him more than anything else in the world. And because God is a jealous God, and you ought to know what jealousy is like. Jealousy is the fear of being replaced. Now, I don't think God lives in fear, but God does not want to be replaced. You see, whenever a girl likes a boy and another girl comes along, she gets jealous because she's afraid of being replaced. Jealousy is the fear of being replaced. God doesn't want you to replace him with anything or anybody whatsoever. So God says this is what he wants us to do. So is there a difference between the true and the living God? Take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, 115th Psalm. The 115th Psalm. <clears throat> now remember this morning, I am not attacking anybody's religion. I will refer to some that attack my beliefs. But I'm not attacking anybody else's belief. But if somebody does attack what I believe, should I then not have the right to defend myself? If I'm attacked, shouldn't I not be able to defend myself? I think that most people would agree, yes, you do. And so, yes, I will. I'm the sweetest guy in all the world. Wouldn't hurt a flea. Psalms 115. I want you to look there in verse 1. Verse 1, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy true sake. Boy, that sounds pretty humble, don't it? Give God all the credit. Give God all the glory. What? Because he deserves it. Salvation, going to heaven. God said it's not of works lest any man should boast or take some of the credit, take some of the glory. So God says that a man cannot save himself by his works because God does not want to give glory to the man because God's already declared the man can't save himself, so he can't take credit. He can't boast, look what I've done. A person who tries to earn their way to heaven by their good works are robbing honor and glory from God, saying, look at me. I get to go to heaven because I sung in the choir. 
I went to church. I gave money. I was a goody, goody two-shoes. Therefore, because of all how good I was, I get to go to heaven. And God says, not by works of righteousness, but by his mercy he saves us. Oh, look what he says in verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Where is their God? So I wrote down a, a little statement saying, heathens have God idols. Heathens have idols. Heathens have false gods. You and I are supposed to know the true and living God, and therefore we don't need an idol. We don't worship a man. We don't worship a building. We don't worship statues or any kind of man-made objects. We worship God and Him only. And now look there in verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So when men take silver and gold and wood and carve and make themselves little idols or little statues, and the size of it is not the, the issue whether it's small or whether it's big. And you can go into some churches and they'll have big statues. And they'll have little statues. But they say, these don't, we don't worship them. They just represent. Then if you was to take them all and throw them in a heap and burn them all, what would be their feelings about that or do they not worship these things God says not to do so and making a little idols things that you believe that this is going to protect me God says I'm God I do the protecting what does these little idols or big idols, what do they take away from the true and living God? What would you focus upon them that you cannot focus upon God? So he says here, it's not important what you and I think about it. It's not important what we want it to mean or what it represents to us. Look what God says about it. So he says here in verse 3, Excuse me, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. That they make them... They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. The purpose is there's some certain amount of human trust that put into an idol. That's made by man's hands. And God says, don't do it. Period. You don't do it. Now take your Bible and look in the 135th Psalm. The 135th Psalm. In the 135th Psalm, I want you to look there in verse 15. Verse 15. It's on page 665 in your Bible. And notice verse 15, it says, The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouth. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusts in them. Same thing we read a while ago. <coughs> so, heathens have idols. That's because you don't know the true and living God. I don't need an idol. Don't need one. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 22. The book of Revelation, chapter 22. 
when Jay was reading the scriptures this morning, I thought, well, if he just read two more verses, he'll have my verses read for me. So in Revelation chapter 22, I want you to look there. In verse 8, look in verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And you ought to underline these two words. Worship God. Bowing before a man that you think more than a man is idol worship. It is wrong. It is wicked. It is an abomination to God. God says, no, you don't do it. You are only to bow in order to worship the true and living God. He's the king. He's the Lord. Uh, take your Bible and look there in the book. Revelation chapter 19, first of all. Revelation 19. We know that one day we're going to be in heaven and we're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Bible says that we're going to be dressed in the righteous acts of the saints because we just came from the judgment seat of Christ where we have been rewarded for what we've done for the Lord. And so however we're dressed is going to be a reflection of our service to the Lord and what we've done for Him. So he says there in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the white or fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at His feet to worship Him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Those two words again. You only worship God. You don't bow to a man in order that he is more than a man. or He's in place of God and he becomes an idol to a person. God says you don't do that in his word. Take your Bible now and turn to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John in chapter 5. And you notice starting there in verse 10. In verse 10 makes this statement. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So whether you have eternal life or not depends on whether or not do you have the Son. It's not do you have the church? Do you have the certain preacher? Do you have all your good works? Do you have the person? So you can have all those things, but if you don't have Christ, you got zero. But if you have Christ, you have enough. You have enough. Christ is all you need to go to heaven. He that hath the Son hath life. If I got that, it's all I need is eternal life. He that hath not the Son hath not eternal life. So he says in verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe. That's all you have to do. That believe. On the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life. So can you know you have eternal life? Well, yes, if you have Christ. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It's okay to worship Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God. You can bow before Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God. He's not an idol. He is God. But if you take salvation away from him and put it into anything else is to put that above God. And that makes God angry. That makes God mad. God is a jealous God. God says that's wicked. That's an abomination. And we're not to do that. 
Now, let me just mention this to you. In the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 15, there's a little story there about Samuel telling uh, Saul what to do and uh, when he became king and how to deal with the Amalekites. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't fully obey. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And the Bible talks about it. It is idolatry. It's idolatry. Not to obey the Lord. So I wrote this little statement down. <coughs> the reasons for rebellion are as witchcraft and idolatry. Now think for a moment. Even if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know you're going to heaven when you die. The reasons that you give for not fully serving the Lord with all of your heart is witchcraft because it's rebellion, it's idolatry. You worship your excuses more than obedience to God. So can a Christian be involved in idol worship? Worshiping the excuses or the reasons why you're not fully serving God like you ought to. You may use a church as your reason for justification. And you can use somebody else as a reason for justification. You can use your people where you work as a reason. I don't care what it is. Are there reasons, those excuses, do they supplant the word of God? Do you put those above what God has to say? Many people do. I want to read a couple of things to you that I have because somebody has offended me. <coughs> if the differences between what the Bible teaches and what the Catholic Church teaches are insignificant, then we are to be blamed for being divisive and therefore destructive to the unity of the Christian faith. However, if the differences are irreconcilable, then the wrong belief condemns somebody to an eternity separated from the Lord. So are the differences that we have in what we believe, and keep us in mind, this is not designed to attack anyone, but to defend our position, my position that I have in the Word of God. Because there's many people that become very hurt and very offended if you say something about their religious belief. But it's okay for them to say it about us. There's a religion today called uh, the religion of Islam. It's okay for them to take our Jesus Christ off the cross and to say that he never came back from the dead. It's okay for them to mutilate our religious beliefs. But don't you say one word against their religion. Because that offends them and they'll cut off your head because you made them mad. Oh, I take offense to that. If it's good for the goose, good for the gander. But that, 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 that's okay. It's not going to change what I believe. But there's others, over one billion people that are also... Roman Catholic. Now, I'm not attacking the Roman Catholics. If you're Catholic, listen to what I'm saying, that's all. But follow, follow, follow my thinking. I just want a person to know what they are saying about me and what I believe. Because there has been an attack made. And I think you ought to know what it is. And so I don't have no other way of doing this except in a public forum. Because otherwise you won't be here and then I won't be able to tell you. So let me read this to you. For all its serious problems, the Roman Catholic Church cannot be faulted 
for misunderstanding what evangelicals or fundamentalists believe in the gospel of salvation since it is spelled out in no uncertain terms in Romans and Rome's official canons and decrees. So they fully understand my position because they wrote it down and it's in their material. It's in what they teach. The following citations are from the Council of Trent, which met over a 19-year period primary to denounce the teachings of the Protestant Reformation. Although the council met in the 16th century, its decrees were reaffirmed by the church's most recent councils, both Vatican I and II. Consider Catholicism's position on what evangelicals uphold as the gospel. In other words, they will tell us what we believe. Now, this is what they say we believe. The sixth session, Canon 9. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be anathema. So they say, this is what we believe, and those that believe this, let them be anathema. Now the word anathema, according to Webster's New World Dictionary, is a condemnation. It's a formal curse and is used in excommunication, a person. So if I believe this heresy, and they're calling this heresy, and if I believe that, I'm supposed to be cursed, excommunicated, destined for hell. The sixth session, Canon 12, said this. If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is this confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. That's what I believe. So they fully understand what I believe. And they say, I need to go to hell for what I believe. I have been under a curse for believing what I believe. And because I don't believe like they believe, they get to go to heaven and I get to go to hell. <coughs> they say this. I'm just telling you what they said. Don't, don't get mad at me. I haven't said anything against them yet, have I? I'm only telling you that they understand who I am and where I'm coming from and what I believe. And so far, they're right. So I'm telling you, they're right. This is what I believe. But they say, I should be anathema, accursed. In the sixth session, Canon 30, if anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner, that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged, either in this world or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. <coughs> Boy, they got it down what I really believe. I can't believe they really understand what I believe so well. So they know where I'm coming from. Now, I'm not talking about you. I, I don't know what you believe. I'm just telling about what I believe. The seventh session. Canon 4, if anyone says that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary for salvation, but without them men obtain from God through faith alone the grace of justification, let him be anathema. Well, they nail me again. They've made four statements, and all four of them is what I believe to the hilt. I really believe that a man is justified, made righteous by faith and faith alone. Now, unless a man or a church is perfect, how can the unjust justify the unjust? You didn't get that, so I'm going to repeat it. 
unless the church or a person is perfect, then that means they are unjust. How can the unjust justify the unjust? It can't happen. Now, I believe that what is written in the Word of God is so important. In contrast to the Roman Catholic process of salvation through meritorious works, the Apostle Paul gives the biblical teaching that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works, but it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul insists that to him that worketh not but believeth on Jesus Christ justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And again in Galatians, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Demanding that works are necessary for salvation is an outright rejection of Christ's perfect and complete atonement for sins on the cross. And therefore, I take issue. Can the unjust justify the unjust? No. Christ alone is the justifier of the unjust because he, he is just. He is righteous. He is perfect. He can declare me perfect and righteous because the payment he made on the cross was put to my account by faith and faith alone. Now, I wrote down something also. And I wrote this. Do they have idols of silver, gold, or wood that they pray to or through or use for protection? It's just a question. It's not, not an attack. But do they not? Is the Pope made more than a man? Just think now. Just think. think. Do they make him to be more than a man? If he's just a man, then he's a man like all men. And he's a sinner like all men. God says that God is true, that God is perfect, God is righteous. Every man is a liar. Would that include him? Would that include him? It's just the Bible. I'm not attacking anything. But is every man a sinner? God's word says there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If that is truth, then the Pope is not perfect. He's just a man. And if he's just a man, to be made into more than a man is idol worship. It's idol worship. I didn't say that. God said that. You can't lift men up higher than they are. They're just a man. The best man in this world has ever lived. He's just a man. And he's a sinner at that. But he's just a man. And for example, if you make a woman more than just a woman, did you exalt that person to be more than a woman? Or is she just a woman? Mary was used by God. The Holy Spirit planted that seed, that holy thing inside of her womb. And she gave birth to the Son of God. But she was just a woman. She was a virgin. And she declared about Jesus her Savior. If He is her Savior... Would that mean that she needed to be saved? If she needed to be saved, does that mean she was a sinner? To make her any more than what she is, 
It's witchcraft. Rebellion to God. It's heresy. She's just a woman that God used. She's not to be prayed to or through. I don't need Mary to get to God. Jesus came to open up the way that I can have access unto the Father through the Son and no one else. It's idolatry. It's wickedness to place anything between you and God except the man Christ Jesus. He is the mediator, the only mediator. There is nobody else. And to make something into more than what God's Word says is idolatry. God is a jealous God. It's not to be done. The church, the Catholic church, stole the saving power from Christ and claimed salvation is in her church. Now think about who Christ is. What he did on the cross. He died to pay for all the sins of all the world so that everybody in the world can be saved because of him. To steal that power away from Christ and claim it for your own, our church can now save you. And you must belong to our church is heresy. I, I didn't teach that. God's word says that. Don't get mad at me. If, I even, if I'm going to teach this book, teach the book. Or throw the thing in the trash and go do whatever I want to do. Go sell cars. But this book is true. God says there is truth. And there is heresy. And there is lies. There is deception. The priest, and I preached a couple weeks ago, on who can forgive sins. No man can forgive you of any sin. When the sin is against you and God. If you sin against me. I can forgive you. If you sin against me. I can forgive you. But if you sin against God. You got to deal with him. No man can intervene. And there are priests of different religions, and they've stole from Christ the power of forgiveness. And they claim it. We have it. You come to me. Confess your sins to me. And to lift any man above a man is idolatry, and it's wicked. The Catholic Church has left a helpless, naked man on the cross with no power to save. And that's why you still see him hanging on their cross. Because he has no power. He can't save anybody. According to their religion. But I don't believe Jesus is on the cross. He died on the cross, and I believe he was buried, and he came back from the dead, and that he lives forever in heaven, and that he will give to me, and only him, the free gift of eternal life. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, and him alone, you're not saved, and you are anathema. Now, I didn't say that. God did. That's why Christ died, so that you and I can know that we have eternal life. He didn't put that into people's hands. He didn't put it into a building or a church. It's in a message. The gospel points everyone to Jesus Christ. That's what I spoke on last Sunday from Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Everyone that believes can have the power of God to save them. And see, the devil will do whatever possible to strip away from Christ the power to save. And what the devil does is interject works into salvation. Because if a man is saved by grace, means you don't deserve it, you don't earn it, you don't work for it. They always say, well, there's 
a few things you have to do. You've got to do this, and then you've got to do this, and you've got to do this. And, and any time you add to it, you can never know for sure if you're going to go to heaven. I know that I have eternal life, and I know that I'm going to heaven when I die because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And understand me well this morning. I did not attack the Catholic Church. I agreed with what they said about what I believe. And I told you what God's Word said. They state what they believe. I stated what the Word says. And you can take it from there. But I believe that what God's Word says is the truth. Let me show you something. You've never seen this before. Let this hand represent you and me, and the wallet represents sin. Now, the Bible says that we all have sin on us. That means that everybody's in the same boat. Nobody's any better than anyone else. Listen to me. If God's Word says we have all sinned, all, none of us are good enough to go to heaven. That means that Mother Teresa will not go to heaven because Mother Teresa did good works. That means that the Pope will not go to heaven because the Pope's trying to do good works. It means that Mary is not going to heaven because Mary's trying to do good works. It means that no Catholic priest or Mother Superior or anybody is going to heaven because they do any good works. Not only them, but anybody else in the whole world. It means that Yankee Arnold, this preacher right here, I'm not going to heaven because I do good works either. And neither is Fred down here. He's not going to heaven because he's, he's been a good boy. And Peter over here, he's going to go to heaven because he's been good. No, he's not. No man. My wife is a good wife. Been married to her going on 52 years. But she can't go to heaven because she's been such a good wife. She cannot earn her way to heaven. She is in reality no better than Mother Teresa or Mother Superior. Well, I think she is. But in the eyes of God, we are all sinners and there is no difference. We are all the same in God's eyes. And you don't put and lift a man up to be more than a man. He's just a man. Just a man. And you understand this. I am just a man. Don't you worship me. I saw a while ago. I saw Dr. Poston standing right here. And I saw James kneeling before him. <laughs> Remember that, James? <laughs> <laughs> and we said that, and then he went like this. <laughs> but I knew what I was speaking on this morning. See, he didn't. And I, I remember. But God loves us. He loves all of us the same. He loves me and he loves Peter and loves Fred and my wife and he loves Mother Teresa and he loves Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini. He loves all of them. God so loved the whole world and he paid for all the sins of the whole world. So that anybody in the whole world, if they would believe that Christ did it for them, they could know they have eternal life. You see, to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. That's why you can't earn eternal life. You can't work your way to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's to believe that when Jesus Christ, who was God's Son, came into the world because He loves us, that He paid for my sins. He paid for all of them. And all that I have to do, the only thing I can do is believe He did it for me. And God made it on the level that anybody can have it. You see, if I accept it as a free gift, and he gives me eternal life right now as a free gift, can I, can I know I'm going to heaven if I have eternal life? If all of my sins are paid, there's none for me to pay for. Then what sin's going to condemn me to hell? I can't go to hell. I've got eternal life. So can I know I'm going to heaven before I die? Yes. But if my going to heaven depends upon my good works... Well, then I'll have to wait till I live my whole life before I find out if they were good enough. That's why most people don't know where they're going when they die because, see, they don't know how they're going to live. How good are you going to live? Am I going to mess up before it's all over with? 
That means you're trusting in your good deeds to get you to heaven. And God says, you can't save yourself. Don't try that. Don't go down that road. Just be honest. Admit, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ paid for my sins, and I'm going to accept that payment he made for me so I don't have to pay it. And he made that payment for you, and the day you trust him, he gives you as a free gift everlasting life, and you get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for you. Would you trust him? Would you trust Jesus Christ and him alone as your only hope of going to heaven? I pray that you will. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if you're here this morning, maybe you've heard these things before, maybe you haven't. But you say, that made sense to me, and I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. And preach, I'd like for you to pray for me. Friend, I'm not going to have you forward, not going to embarrass you, but right where you're sitting, if what I said made sense to you, would you trust the Lord? I'd like to have prayer for you, and I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just know that we don't have a guarantee on life, and you may never come back. I might never get a chance to talk to you again. And I would hate to think that you left this auditorium without trusting the Lord. So in the quietness of this moment, just between you and the Lord, would you say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Christ died and paid for my sins, and I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to trust a church. I'm not going to trust a preacher. I'm not going to trust a priest. I'm not going to trust nobody but you. Friend, how can you go wrong by trusting the only true and living God there is? He knows who you are. He knows what you've done, knows what you're going to do. Still loves you. Would you trust him? Would you believe he died for you? And he said, if you'll trust him as your Savior, he would give you the free gift of eternal life, and you get to go to heaven whenever you die. If there's anyone at all, would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Just slip it up real quick. Just say, yes, pray for me. I'll trust Christ as my Savior. I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's over and done with when you make that decision. And one all before we close, say, I want to be certain of going to heaven. Whatever the reasons are that you use for not trusting the Lord becomes an idol that you worship. You put it between you and Him. Our Father, we thank you so much for this time together. And Lord, we pray your will to be done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.